Hello and welcome back to the final episode of the Come Follow Me Bible Challenge. This all began with an idea. It began with a dream. <laughs> no, it, it began in January of 2022 when I thought, you know, if the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, a.k.a. the Mormon Church, is going to be studying through the Bible, why don't I do that with them and provide some thoughts as a Bible church pastor to those who might be interested in hearing my perspective on our book, the Christian book. And so in January of 2022, we started looking at the book of Genesis, and here we are, the final episode covering the final chapters of the book of Revelation. For those of you who have been along for the ride, thanks. I hope this has been helpful to you. And uh, for those who are just joining in late, there's a whole bunch of episodes you can catch up on. I'd love for you to do that uh, to learn more about the Bible. But today we go to the book of Revelation, chapter 19, as we begin this final episode. Revelation, chapter 19, starting in verse 7. Now, last week we talked very briefly. Now, let me go back to just me there so you don't start reading quite yet. Last week we talked quite briefly about how the church will be rescued from the wrath that is to come, the wrath of God poured out on the face of the earth, mediated through angels. The church isn't around when you read Revelation 6 through 18 when all of that is happening because Christians were not destined for wrath and Christians will be rescued from the wrath that is to come. That's the testimony of the Bible. So uh, now we are going to look at the church showing up again here in Revelation chapter 19. They've been gone, chapter 6 through 18, and they show up again in chapter 19. And I know that was really fast last week when we talked about those concepts, but I, when I recorded that, I think I recorded it on like the last Friday of November or the first Friday of December, something like that. I was not feeling well. I was getting sick and, uh, <laughs> it just, I, I had to rush through it cause I was feeling like something bad was about to happen. So sorry, I didn't give that a thorough treatment, but I've covered the idea of the rapture of the church in other places. And uh, if you want to know more about that, just reach out to me and I could send you all sorts of links, all sorts of teaching that I've done on that, where you can hear more, find out more about my perspective. But church was raptured, wrath of God poured out on the face of the earth. Now, Revelation 19, the church shows up again, starting in verse 7. It says, Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. The bride of the Lamb is the church. So that's where the church is, in heaven, getting ready for the marriage supper. Verse 8. It was given to her, the church, to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true words of God. Then I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, Do not do that. I am a fellow servant of yours and your brethren who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So this is an angel refusing worship. John tries to worship this angel falling at his feet, and he says, No, 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 I'm just a servant. I'm just a creature like you. Don't do that. But the image, the, the vision that is given to John here is one of the bride of Christ, the bride of the Lamb, the church herself, clothed in her own righteous deeds that were, of course, enabled through the power of God. And uh, it's this time of, of union. It's this time of coming together. Because right now, uh, the church has been betrothed to Christ. You can see this in a couple of different places in the New Testament. Second Corinthians chapter 11 Paul tells the church in Corinth, I have betrothed you to one husband. And he looks forward to that day when he's going to present this church to Christ, the bridegroom. He's going to present at least this aspect, uh, this portion of the bride to the bridegroom. 
In John chapter 14, Jesus himself uses this kind of language when he tells his disciples that they belong to him, and he's going away to his father's house to prepare a place for them, and he's going to come back, gather them to himself, that where he is they will be also. This is the the language of betrothal. What would happen in an engagement in the first century is uh, the man and the woman would become betrothed to one another, engaged. This is, of course, very fitting this time of year because we're talking about Christmas a lot here in December, and uh, we know that Joseph and Mary were betrothed, and uh, Mary was a virgin and had the baby Jesus. And a really interesting aspect of that story is Joseph sticking with her, and um, did he believe her? Did he not believe her? What evidence do we have? What did his family think, her family think? Because they were not yet married. They were only betrothed. Okay, that's a really interesting cultural aspect. But what would happen is when the two become betrothed, the man would then need to go prepare a place for his bride, and he would come back and and get the bride. It was a multi-step process. And there would be celebrations, the wedding feast, etc., and a marriage supper, too. And uh, this is the vision that is given for the church in the future, one day, at the, at the end of a, uh, the age, there will be this marriage supper where the church and her bridegroom, Jesus Christ himself, are brought together, and it's a great celebration. Blessed is everyone who is invited to this supper. It'll be a blessed celebration. So the church will be taken from the world, and the wrath will be happening on the face of the earth. And during that time, the church will go through her judgment because just because you're a Christian, that doesn't mean you won't be judged. There is a judgment seat of Christ that all Christians must stand before. And at the end of that, once uh, things are all burnt away that are impure from the Christian's account, uh, that's how 1 Corinthians 3 describes that judgment, then the pure bride of Christ will only be dressed in her righteous deeds bright and pure, fine linen, white and clean. And at that point, there will be this total, full union. And uh, it's an amazing, amazing picture. But that's not the end of the story. Uh, you, You might suspect, oh, okay, well then that's it, and then we're in heaven, and that's the end. But no, 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 that is not the it, not the end. There is so much more that happens. This is just uh, halfway through chapter 19. So you got the second half of chapter 19 and then chapters 20, 21, and 22 that have events that continue on after this marriage supper of the Lamb. And so even though this is really critical, really important, and kind of a, uh, I don't know, a closure giving event where, you know, all things that were done outside of faith have been burnt away, and now all that remains are the righteous deeds, and there's nothing now uh, that's like left unsaid between the church and her Lord. Everything is made right. Even though there's a lot of closure in that, there's still a lot to do. There's still a lot to come. And right after we read this passage, look at what happens next. We go from the marriage supper to, as the heading in my Bible says, the coming of Christ. I just mentioned it's Christmas time, and that means we are focusing on the first advent of Christ or the first coming of Christ when he was born of Mary. Well, there's a second advent of Christ, a second coming of Jesus. And though the first time he came in great humility as a baby, having to be taken care of by others, and as a lamb being led to the slaughter— The second time he comes, he is coming as King of Kings, Lord of Lords, explicitly, with there being no doubt about who he is or what he is to do, and uh, it's going to be pretty intense. And uh, he's not the lamb led to the slaughter, he's the lion of Judah who's returning. So let's read about that. Revelation 19, starting at verse 11. It says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. 
And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So let's just pause there for a moment. There's a lot to see today, so I don't want to take too much time here. But look at verse 14. It says that the armies in heaven, specifically those clothed in fine linen, white and clean, are coming with Jesus. Well, that should sound familiar because we just read about fine linen, white and clean. The church, the bride of Christ, returns with Jesus. So that means they had to be out of the world. The believers in Christ had to be taken out of the world so that they could return with Christ. And in order to be in fine linen, white and clean, which are their righteous deeds, in order for that to happen, they had to undergo their judgment first. And that which was uh, done not based on faith in Jesus had to be burned up so that it would no longer remain. And all that would be left are their righteous deeds. So that's why, uh, one of the reasons why, there are actually several reasons, but that's one of the reasons why there has to be an evacuation, a, a catching up of the church that takes place before the tribulation period, because all that stuff has to happen so that they can return with Jesus in this way. Okay? And look at what he's doing. Verse 15 says, From Jesus' mouth is a sharp sword. And what's he going to do with that sharp sword? He's going to strike the, down the nations and rule them with a rod of iron. So following Jesus' coming is this ruling with a rod of iron. With the sword, an instrument of killing, he's going to strike down the nations. Those nations that have rebelled against him, those who have rejected him, they will be judged with some swift physical judgment with a sword. And he's not just going to like slaughter them and then walk away. He's going to rule the nations with a rod of iron. So some leaders will be struck down, but the nations themselves won't dissolve. They won't go away. This isn't entering into some sort of a state where, uh, you know, nations no longer exist and kingdoms no longer exist. On the contrary, there's going to be a kingdom of Jesus, the son, where he is ruling all the nations with a rod of iron. And the Old Testament has a lot to say about this time period that's coming. And that's going to follow the second coming. But let's keep reading. Verse 17. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds which fly in midheaven, Come, assemble for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of commanders and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of those who sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free men and slaves, and small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Right, so you have uh, the angel declaring to birds that they can come feast on the carcasses of those whom Jesus has struck down. Well, he hasn't struck down all the people yet, uh, all the enemies yet, because there will be the beast and some kings who haven't been killed with their armies assembled to make war against Jesus and against his army, which again is the church who returns with him. That'll be people like me. <laughs> really crazy to think about this time period, putting myself in this spot. I'm going to be returning with Jesus as a member of his army. I will be seeing this verse play out with my own eyes. Woo! My resurrected, glorified eyes will behold this battle. Oh, man, that's amazing. That's enough to send a shiver down your spine. Very, very cool. Well, uh, it's cool because we're going to win. We can't die. Um, we've been resurrected and glorified. Jesus has been resurrected and glorified. These armies are going to lose. Let's keep reading. Verse 20. The beast was seized, and with him the false prophet who performs the signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire, which burns with brimstone, 
And the rest were killed with the sword, which came from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. So they seek to rebel against Jesus one final time. This is, in their view, basically their last hope to succeed. And they're not going to win. There's, there's no chance that Jesus will lose. And so they lose. And uh, after this, Jesus rules with a rod of iron. We just saw in ver- uh, chapter 19 where he has a sword coming out of his mouth to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. We just read about the sword coming out of his mouth to strike down the nations. Now we're going to read about his ruling with a rod of iron. So, Revelation chapter 20. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he threw him into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. After these things, he must be released for a short time. Then I saw thrones, and they that sat on them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received the mark on their forehead and on their hand. And they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. So we just read about striking down kings of nations with the sword of his mouth. And we read about the beast and the false prophet being struck down also. I kind of forgot to mention anything about that. That's the Antichrist and the vice Antichrist, you could say. Those who implemented this mark for buying and selling, the mark of the beast, while the church was taken out of the earth, that was going on on the face of the earth where they were enacting these kinds of laws on the face of the earth. The beast can perform so many signs and wonders, and he can make fire rain down from heaven, and uh, he has a lot of control and is controlling the people. Well, he gets killed. And after he's killed and and the false prophet with him, they're thrown into the lake of fire, which burns with brimstone. So even though they're dead, there is something that remains. Okay, They're struck down with the sword from Jesus, and yet they, as people, continue on. Their souls do, and they are placed into the lake of fire. Well, after that, Satan, who is the one who was empowering the Antichrist, He is not uh, permanently put away, but he's put into the abyss for a thousand years, and he's shut and sealed in the abyss, and he's locked away. So he's not able to escape. He's not able to do anything. He can't deceive the nations any longer because he's no longer active. At this point, he is no longer the god of this age. He's no longer the one in whose hand lies the whole world. Okay, He doesn't have that power anymore. Currently, he does. But looking forward to this time when Jesus comes back and Satan gets put into this abyss, he loses his status as prince of the power of the air. And we have in his place the ruler being Jesus. And Jesus now is going to reign for a thousand years with an explicit kingdom in the world, explicit kingdom on the face of the earth. It says in the Old Testament that he's going to reign from Jerusalem and that this will be a time of peace and prosperity. It will be an amazing time where uh, there will be geographical changes. There will be uh, people who live longer. So the church has already been glorified never to die again, but there will be other people who are in this kingdom who will die. But when they die at 100, it's like they're dying as children because people, their their lives will, will be longer. Uh, Amazing changes will happen on the face of the earth, and the disciples of Jesus Christ will rule and reign with him. Jesus promised his disciples in Matthew 19, 28, that the 12 disciples will sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel during this time. And so it'll be just an absolutely amazing time. And Satan is 
put away for these thousand years. So are you catching the order here? Church taken up into heaven while God's wrath is poured out on the face of the earth. Church goes through judgment and then has this marriage supper with the Lamb, returns with the Lamb, Jesus himself, to strike down his enemies, including the Antichrist and the Vice Antichrist. And then Satan, being put away for a thousand years, gives now the opportunity for uh, the church to reign with Christ and for the explicit kingdom to be on the face of the earth for 1,000 years. And it'll be an amazing reign where there's no question that Jesus is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But that's not the end. Okay, we already said it's a 1,000 years. So when the 1,000 years are up, what happens next? Well, let's keep reading in Revelation chapter 20, starting with verse 7. It says, When the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for the war. The number of them is like the sand of the seashore. And they came up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, and fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are also. Okay, so there's going to be a final war. Satan will be released from his prison at the end of this explicit kingdom of Jesus. And when he does so, those who are not glorified, those who go into the kingdom with bodies that can die again, there will be some of them who make up these nations in the four corners of the earth who will be deceived by Satan. Remember, he was put into the abyss so that he would deceive the nations no longer. What's the first thing he does when he comes out of the abyss? He deceives the nations. Those whom are still eligible for being deceived, he deceives them to gather them together for the war. This, it's so crazy. This same Jesus who came back and struck down all of his enemies, struck down the most powerful human leader the world has ever seen, the Antichrist and his false prophet, the one who just put Satan away for a thousand years, showing that he has power over every authority because Jesus is God, the top authority. Satan still thinks he can beat him with war. <laughs> don't get me wrong. Satan is very smart, but don't get me wrong. Satan is stupid. All right. He's going to gather them together for the war. And there's going to be a lot of them. The number of them is like the sand of the seashore. So crazy. Well, how are they going to be defeated? It says fire came down from heaven and devoured them. So Satan is going to get his people together for one last battle. And I like to think that as soon as they all get together and organize and they say, okay, this is what we're going to do. March forward. They take their first step and without anybody having to really lift a finger, just fire comes down and destroys them. And that's the end. The battle is over before it started. Well, the devil who deceived them at that point, he gets thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone. The same place it says explicitly where the beast and the false prophet are. So, Fittingly, Satan now has moved from the abyss, trying to do a little battle on earth for a second, now put into the lake of fire, which is a permanent place for him. And this lake of fire isn't his domain. I know the world would like to make it seem like Satan rules hell, like that's his place. And he is uh, like in charge. He's God. He's the boss when it comes to hell. That's not true. The lake of fire is designed by God. God is present there. God is in charge of that, and the devil is going to suffer there. All right, so that's a paradigm shift for some of you. But that's where he's going. And notice that they, the devil, the beast, the false prophet, all of those who end up in the lake of fire will be tormented day and night forever and ever. It's a place that lasts forever. It goes on eternally. It's eternal conscious torment the punishment they deserve for their sins, their rebellion. All right. What's next? We're not done yet. You, you think, okay, that's the end of the story. No, no, no. Verse 11, Revelation 20, verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it, from whose presence the uh, earth and heaven fled away. And no place was found for them. 
And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne. And the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found in the book of life, written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. All right, this is what we call the great white throne judgment. There's a great white throne of God, and this is a judgment for the world. This isn't the judgment for Christians. That happened before when the wrath of God was being poured out on the face of the earth. Christians were in heaven at the Father's house enduring judgment, which isn't like this judgment. It's still a judgment, but it's not for salvation or about salvation. It's a purging away of those things that were not done by faith in Jesus. Um, Christians endured that before. This judgment is for unbelievers, all right? Because you don't see an option here for people who, according to their deeds, getting on good terms with God. That's not something that the Bible has to offer. If you're looking for a way to be made right with God according to your deeds, you're not going to find it in the Bible. And you see here, there are two books at this judgment, and it's going to be all people. The great and the small. So no matter how you died, no matter who you were when you died, if you were not in Christ when you died, you're going to be at this judgment. You're going to be standing before the throne. And there are two books that are going to be opened as you're standing before the throne. One is the book of life. That's a book of names. God wrote names in the book of life from before the foundation of the world. Those whom he has chosen for salvation, their names are in that book. Well, there's another book, the book of their deeds. So you've got the book of life, and you have the book of their deeds. If you were standing before the Lord and your name is not found, in the book of life and you have the book of your deeds opened up, how do you think this judgment's going to go? It's going to go very, 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 very poorly. There is no chance of you walking away from that encounter with God thinking, wow, you deserve heaven, you righteous person. No, God knows your heart. He knows everything you've ever done. And he's a very, In fact, I was going to say very fair judge. That's not the right terminology. He's a perfect judge. So those things that you have done, which are wrong, like any good judge, he's going to punish you for those things. And that's what we see happening at the great white throne judgment. The dead come to to life. They're resurrected. Now, their souls have been apart from their bodies. Their bodies have gone into the ground or or however they died, wherever their bodies were. Their souls lived on, and they went to Hades, what we commonly call hell. Well, at this point, their bodies come to life. Their souls are rejoined with their bodies, and they stand before God in judgment. Hades itself gets thrown into the lake of fire. Hades or hell is not permanent. The lake of fire is permanent. And these people who are standing before God— With soul and body together, once again, they stand before him and look at the result of this judgment. If anyone's name is not found in the book of, written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire, body and soul into that permanent place, the lake of fire. And remember, the lake of fire right up here, according to verse 10, burns forever and ever. People are tormented there forever and ever. That is the result for those who are at the great white throne judgment. You should want to avoid that judgment with every fiber of your being. You should want to find some way to not be there, but instead to be in Christ so that you could be 
in Jesus' army and rule and reign with him and have success over all of Jesus' enemies. That's what you should want. Well, the, the difference between the great white throne judgment and victory in Jesus is the gospel. What do you do with the gospel? Have your sins been covered by the blood of the lamb? Have you been made right with God on the basis of his grace through faith alone in the finished work of Jesus Christ? That's the difference. That is the difference, my friend. Do you see the the grace of Christ, his mercy and his love dying in your place for your sins on the cross, rising again on the third day, proving that he is who he said he was, that he is Lord of Lords. He has all rule and authority and power. Do you recognize that he has ascended into heaven? He's at the father's right hand and that he intercedes for his people as the final great priest. He's our great high priest who is our only righteousness because of what he has done. We rely on his work, not just on the cross, but continuing to intercede for us. Do you, do you see Jesus as that for you? Is he precious to you? Does he have your life? If so, then my friend, you're a believer. If so, then, then you don't need to fear the great white throne judgment. You don't need to fear Hell, you don't need to fear the lake of fire. You don't need to fear what is to come, the wrath of God being poured out on the face of the earth because Jesus rescues you from the wrath to come. Jesus gives you the victory. Jesus gives you ruling and reigning and and a beautiful future all to the glory of God in him. And that's really, 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 really good news. It's the best news you could ever receive that Jesus rescues you from the wrath that is to come including the great white throne judgment. However, if you reject the gospel, if you put your hand up and say, no, I, uh, I, I don't need that. Uh, I don't believe that. My works will save me. If that is your mentality, you will end up at the great white throne judgment. And let me tell you, your works won't save you in that day. Make no mistake, your works will be made evident. Your works will be revealed. You will be naked before the Lord. And you will not pass that test. You will not make it past this judgment as someone who uh, the Lord considers to be righteous. Your only hope of being considered righteous by the Lord is finding your righteousness in the work of Jesus Christ, finding your righteousness through the grace of God, not through your own works. And if, if you see that and you have faith in what Jesus has done, you can know you're saved. You can have absolute certainty. You can have total assurance that you are saved. If you reject Jesus, the biblical Jesus, if you reject the, the gospel, the biblical gospel, you have no assurance. You have no certainty. Instead, you have the great white throne and the lake of fire. Well, for those who have believed in Jesus, the story goes on. If you don't believe in Jesus, this is kind of like the end. You go to the lake of fire and that's it. This is the end for you. However, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ and if you're saved by his grace, there are two more chapters for you in the Bible. So let's check out Revelation 21. These we're just going to cover really, really briefly. There's a new heaven and a new earth. Verse 1 of chapter 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people. And God himself will be among them, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write, for these words are faithful and true. Then he said to me, It is done. 
I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. He who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, and I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. All things will be made new. It will be even better than Genesis chapter 1, because we know in Genesis chapter 1, there was, of course, opportunity for the world to become corrupted. There was opportunity for sin. But at this point, all of that is removed. This will be better than the Garden of Eden. This will be a perfect environment that will last forever and ever under the amazing power, sovereign grace of God. You, Christian, get to look forward to that. Isn't that amazing? Well, uh, there are more details shared about the new heaven and new earth, but let's go ahead and finish with Revelation chapter 22, starting at verse 10. This is how the book ends. He said to me, Do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Let the one who does wrong still do wrong, and the one who is filthy still be filthy. And the one who is righteous still practice righteousness, and the one who is holy still keep himself holy. Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to render to every man according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter by the gates of the city. Outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the immoral persons and the murderers and the idolaters and everyone who loves and practices lying. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come, and let the one who hears say, come, and let the one who is thirsty come, let the one who wishes to take the water of life without cost. I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues which are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city, which are written in this book. He who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming quickly. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen. The end of the book. The end. We reach the end. Very, very important. You don't mess with the book of Revelation. Don't touch those words. Don't change those words. Don't adjust those words because cursed is everyone who adjusts the words of Revelation. That's uh, a a passage that people have used to apply to the whole of the Bible. People have uh, sought to say that that passage, don't add to or take away from the words of this book, means the whole Bible. This book means the whole Bible. But I don't think that's the case. I think it's talking specifically about um, the book of Revelation. I don't think it's talking about the entirety of the Bible. So uh, for what that's worth, there, there are my two cents on that. But either way... Um, it's very important that we recognize that we uh, should not be messing with the book of Revelation. We are blessed if we take it as it is and we read it as it is, but we should not be those who seek to adjust that book. Um, I was trying to look this up as I was talking, and uh, I should have looked at this ahead of time. See, even for the last episode, we can't be polished here. Uh, we... <laughs> It's still me you're talking about, so, you know, this isn't going to be uh, super clean. Um, I have a link on my other computer, a bookmark, that takes me right to the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible. 
because it's difficult to find. I just Googled Joseph Smith translation, and there are two churchofjesuschrist.org links that comes up um, on Google, but neither one of them take you right to that translation, and it's uh, difficult to get to it. It's like they're burying it or something. I mean, maybe they're not, but man, it certainly feels that way. Because um, I wanted to see if Joseph Smith does anything with the book of Revelation. Um, my goodness, this should be easier than what it is. Why is this so difficult? Why is this so difficult? Okay, hold on. Hold on. Okay, I have returned. I had to go over to my other computer and get the uh, exact link. Isn't that crazy? That's what I got to do. Anyway, um, okay, so here is the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible. He is seeking to correct the errors that he said were in the Bible. Very prideful, audacious claim. This is from churchofjesuschrist.org. This is official business. You see over here on the left side, we have the Joseph Smith translation. You just... uh, say, okay, I'm curious about how he changed the Psalms. And you go through and you can see he only adjusted Psalm 11, 14, 24, and 109. Very uh, few adjustments throughout the Bible uh, compared to the whole of the Bible, but still making a man making adjustments. Well, if you go down, you see there it is, Revelation. He did make some changes to Revelation in five different chapters. In Revelation chapter 1, He changed some stuff that you see in uh, italics there. Revelation chapter 2, same thing, a a couple of different places. And we can drop down to Revelation 19, a passage we covered earlier in this series, uh, or this episode. Look at how he changed verses 15 and 21. Out of Jesus' mouth proceedeth not a sword, but it says the word of God. And with it he will smite the nations. And he will rule them with not a rod of iron, but the word of his mouth. And he treadeth the winepress and the fierceness and wrath of the Almighty God. So he changed it. He took away from the words of this book. And you can't really see verse 21 right now. I'm kind of covering it. But in uh, verse 21 of chapter 19, it says, The remnant were slain with the word of him that sat upon the horse, not the sword of him. That sat upon the horse, which word proceeded out of his mouth, and the fowls were filled with their flesh. So, um, why am I bringing this up? Well, it's because in Revelation, we are told, do not change the book of Revelation. And what does Joseph Smith do? He changes the book of Revelation. So again, going back here to uh, the Bible, I had to adjust this a little bit. There we go. Going back to Revelation chapter 22, it says, um, if you add to the words of the prophecy of this book, God will add to that person the plagues which are written in this book. So that's what Joseph Smith gets. If anyone takes away from the words of this book, which Joseph Smith did, um, God will take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city which are written in this book. So Joseph Smith won't be in the new earth, according to this. That's pretty serious stuff. Will you be? Will you be in the new earth, according to what the Bible says about how you get there? Will you take heed of the biblical gospel? Will you believe in Jesus Christ and be saved? Will you be with me? in the armies of heaven, coming back with Jesus to help him subdue the earth and to exercise total victory over all of his enemies with the sword of his mouth, not the word of his mouth, but the sword. Hmm. Would you, uh, would you be a part of that with me by believing in Jesus today? I hope so. Well, now that we're here, I kind of don't want it to end. I mean, this is going to be very helpful for me to have this taken off of my plate with uh, all the other stuff that I do. But, um, man, this has been this has been a good time. Thanks for the ride. And I hope this was really helpful looking at the end of the book. Any thoughts or questions you have, definitely send them my way. Would love to hear from you. Thanks so much for being a part of this Bible challenge.
going through the Bible, Genesis to Revelation. May God bless you richly. May you be a believer in Christ and a brother or sister of mine for all eternity. The Lord bless.